Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor John Hattendorf, the E.J. King Professor here at the Naval War College, Chairman of the Maritime History Department and Director of the War College Museum. It's a special pleasure to welcome you to the first of five Naval Heritage Lectures that we're going to have this year. Uh, the next one will be coming up uh, next month with uh, my colleague uh, Kevin McCraney talking about the Naval War of 1812, and we'll go on with a couple more up through, uh, through the Battle of Midway. Today, what I want to do is to talk to you about the history of this place, the Naval War College and the naval, naval uh, uh, activities here in Narragansett Bay and the uh, activities and the history of the Navy here. Uh, it's your heritage here as part of the War College. Some of you, uh, or perhaps a good number of you, were here at convocation uh, when I spoke to you at that time and gave you a little short history of the college. And I want to elaborate on that now and talk a little bit more about it, uh, and particularly about this place. You can say that the naval side of Narragansett Bay history may have gone all the way back to its discovery. Uh, Giovanni de Verrazzano, an Italian sailing for the King of France, was sailing in a king's ship, the Dauphin, when he came here in 1527 and spent 10 days here in Narragansett Bay. This is a wonderful map that the uh, Naval War College Foundation has recently purchased for the Naval War College Museum. You can come over and see it in our front uh, area there. Um, this was made in Venice in, in 1536. It's an original. This area right here is uh, what he called Refugio, the area, and that's where he spent the 10 days. That's his, the first image of Narragansett Bay uh, in print. Um, the story and how this all got started, when he was sailing along here, he saw one of these islands along here, and he said, you know, that reminds me of the battle, or the, of the island of Rhodes in the Mediterranean, a place he was very familiar with as an Italian sailor. And he said, so, so he gave it that name. And then about more than 100 years later, the first English settlers came down from Massachusetts, started to populate this area, what later became Rhode Island. And Roger Williams, who was uh, had established Providence in 1636, uh, had read the account, the translation of Verrazano's account, and said, oh, well, he's talking about the island, uh, what we call today Aquidneck Island, which is the real Rhode Island uh, that, where the, the colony's uh, name came from. But it was originally transposed from this early uh, connection to uh, uh, what Verrazano saw off, off the coast, probably Block Island is what he saw at that point. The, in the colonial period, of course, there were navies here. It was a British colony established in, uh, in 1644, and then in 1663, it, it was given a, um, a royal charter. It was called the English Colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. Um, uh, there were a lot of privateers located here at this time. One of the most famous uh, figures here is this man. You may know this painting if you're a graduate of the Naval Academy. Uh, this is a huge painting that sits outside, usually sits outside the entrance to the, uh, the inner entrance of the uh, Naval Academy Museum. This is Abraham Whipple, uh, one of the great uh, privateer captains, merchant captain. He worked for the Brown family in Providence. Uh, then later he became the first commander of the Rhode Island State Navy. During the American Revolution, Congress was very doubtful about having a, na a national navy. So the first thing that they allowed to happen was that each of the states could have its navy. And Rhode Island was the very first of those uh, to, to put it into action and actually create it. It was followed shortly later, uh, a bit later by uh, Massachusetts and, and uh, 11 of the 13 colonies, or 12, depending on how, how you count them, um, had actually had a navy. Whipple was also important because he was involved in the Gatsby Affair, one of the early attempts of, uh, of the uh, colonial opposition to uh, the Royal Navy and to, the, to British rule here. Uh, he is uh, in the middle of the war, he, or late, early part of the war, he uh, went on and began to uh, take his ship, the Rhode Island State Ship uh, Providence, which we have a replica of floating here in, in the bay itself now. And he took that and joined the Continental Navy as a captain in the Continental Navy. Of course, his colleague Isaac Hopkins later became the first commander in chief, first equivalent of an admiral uh, in the American forces uh, here. And uh, we had a lot of action here. 
But then uh, the first real action came in 1778. And here you have the French Navy. We had just signed our treaty with France uh, uh, in 1778 between France and the United States to support us against the revolution. And this is a, a drawing. Uh, the original of this is in the Library of Congress by uh, the, the French war artist who was actually on board at the time of the flagship. This is Pierre Ozan. And you can see the ships coming in here into the entrance of Narragansett Bay. The lighthouse there is the lighthouse. Uh, you can still see the foundation of that out at Jamestown, uh, which is the third lighthouse on this uh, east coast, uh, east coast of, the, of North America. And coming in here, and up here you can see the smoke from one of the ships, the English ships. What the English did, they were occupying Newport at the time, and uh, they burned a number of vessels so that the French could not come uh, close into the harbor of Newport. One of those vessels uh, happened to have been the, it was at the time used as a prisoner of war vessel here, but it was a, uh, it originally had been the endeavor that Captain Cook had taken around to Australia. It has only recently been discovered. We, we, we know the wreck is out there, but we don't know which of the many wrecks that are there uh, in this period, because there were about uh, a, a number of vessels that were sunk here. This one that's smoking here is probably uh, a former East Indiaman that was being uh, uh, burnt at the entrance to the harbor, the north entrance to the harbor. The harbor, of course, this is the chart. This is the first hydrographic chart of Narragansett Bay uh, made by de Beers in, seven, uh, in 1776. It was first surveyed from 1764. The Royal Navy had a very great interest in the fact in they saw the advantages of Narragansett Bay from a naval perspective, and they wanted to build a, uh, a naval station here. That never came about, uh, but this was the chart that was used, and they, there was a, a large survey that was done uh, create, called the Atlantic Neptune. Uh, here, it's a little bit hard to see in this uh, slide, but you can see there's the entrance there. We're right there on that little island, Coasters Harbor Island. That's uh, Goat Island uh, out, in, out in the bay uh, there, just off the harbor in there. But the, when the French were here in 1778, uh, they saw, they got a cold of this copy. This Narragansett Bay was the, really the only port in North America that the French, uh, in the English colonies, that they began to, they knew a great deal about uh, by experience. So they managed to acquire a copy of this, and another version of this was published by the French Navy's hydrographic office. And here it shows, this is the uh, Languedoc, the French Admiral uh, d'Estaing, the famous Admiral d'Estaing, uh, fighting his way into Narragansett Bay. There were batteries over here at the site, roughly the present day site of Fort Adams. Uh, and this is the dumplings where the, uh, uh, the Clingstone House is located on now. Later had a couple of fortifications before it became uh, returned into a, a summer colony. And this is what it looked like in the, during the Battle of Rhode Island in 1778, the French fleet coming in the bay up this way. Actually, the, some of them came around the other side of the island. Uh, some of the most famous officers of the French Navy were here as, sh as uh, ship captains. Uh, Suffren, uh, later a famous admiral in the Indian Ocean, and uh, Bougainville, the first uh, uh, French officer to uh, circumnavigate the globe, were here as, as ship captains. And uh, Stang took them up here. The, the English were in occupation of Newport. There were fortifications around Newport, a couple of them still available, you can see here. And the colonial troops coming down here trying to uh, invade uh, and to capture Newport. The French came up here, began to uh, occupy this island and um, uh, support the American troops, the Continental forces here, just when they heard news that the British was outside and the main British fleet was coming outside. The French Admiral was afraid of, of being trapped in blockaded inside Narragansett Bay, so he fought his way back out again. And uh, uh, here, here you can see, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but it, they fought it the way out in just, it was October, or August rather, in, when it was here, and the, uh, uh, what happens in August around here is a, a hurricane. A hurricane blew up, no weather forecasting in those days. So the uh, uh, hurricane came just before they were lining up for a fleet battle, uh, blew many of the vessels down off the Delaware coast, dismasted many of them, uh, making it impossible to have, either have the battle. Uh, the French, in a remarkable feat, uh, repaired themselves at sea and came back up the coast 
uh, called in here again to see what they could do, but really realizing they could do very little, they went on to Boston where they, were, they spent the winter to repair. This uh, map here is, uh, was done in 1780. The French returned again in, in 1780, uh, uh, this being the place where they knew the best, uh, and they brought Rochambeau's army this time. They brought uh, 6,000 troops, landed here, and the French, uh, since they had fought their way into the harbor, they knew exactly how to protect it uh, when they were here. So they lined their ships across here in a kind of a killing zone here, and the way, the way they figured out the uh, broadside angles of the ships here to protect themselves. Uh, the French troops uh, were housed in, uh, in this area, right here, roughly about where the Elms uh, is in Newport, the Elms Mansion here. And uh, they stayed here for a year, uh, and then many of them took boats to Providence, and from Providence walked to Yorktown, uh, where they were uh, joined up on the, in New York, off New York, with George Washington's forces, and were instrumental in the, battle, in the uh, uh, battle at Yorktown in that great victory that won us, won us our independence. The Navy was not very active here uh, in the first part of the 19th century, though we had some really great heroes. Uh, the, the Perry family were here, Oliver Hazard Perry, Matthew Perry, who uh, uh, opened Japan, uh, two brothers here. Uh, there were some vessels outfitted here. Uh, 1869, we had the first permanent station, naval station here, which was the Torpedo Station, the predecessor of the Naval Undersea Warfare Command that's here today. But it was located where the Hyatt Hotel is on Go Goat Island, and that was uh, entirely a naval facility. This little island first gets developed in 1883, and it becomes the first recruit training station uh, in the U.S. Navy. Before that, all enlisted men would be sent to station ships in, in different ports, and then would be put on the ships and had individual training. There was no group training for any enlisted at that time. And that changed in 1883. It was an idea of Commodore Stephen B. Luce to do that, and he cited it here. He was keen on uh, shipboard training, so he brought the ship of the line, New Hampshire, the 74-gun ship of the line, one of the very few that we built here uh, in the United States Navy, but similar to the kinds of warships that were being built in France and, and uh, uh, England at that time. And then the following year in 1884, he acquired this building, the present day War College Museum, and that was the first Naval War College building, first uh, housed the War College until 1889. And this picture shows the first faculty. This is Luce up here. Uh, this is our first civilian professor, uh, James Soley, later an assistant secretary of the Navy, but an expert in international law. Uh, and down here, uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Tasker Bliss, the first uniformed officer, other than uh, uh, Admiral Luce, to be a, a member of the faculty here, an Army officer, uh, who later rose to be first president of the Army War College at, in uh, about 1900, 1901, and then Army Chief of Staff and representative of the United States uh, Army at the uh, Paris Peace Accords in 1919. Very distinguished guy, but he got his ideas about education here at the Naval War College when he founded the Army War College. And of course it was Luce here, that he was the man with the idea. He had developed the whole idea. He was the great thinker about uh, naval education um, with his very stylish uh, mustache and whiskers there. There shows him as president of the War College. Uh, in 1884 to 1886 uh, when he was here. He uh, had been the uh, commander-in-chief of the Atlantic Fleet, uh, the highest position then in the U.S. Navy. We didn't have any uh, officers higher than Rear Admiral in this period. The, uh, uh, other officers didn't come until later, uh, higher ranks. Um, but he went back from here and then he went back out to sea again. Uh, and, but he was the man who developed, he convinced the Secretary of the Navy uh, to have this institution as a place of original research on all questions relating to war and a statesmanship for the prevention of war. That was his uh, initial vision. He repeated that uh, uh, statement several times as a place. There was nowhere in the Navy uh, that you could think about the problem of war itself. Everywhere else that you worked in the Navy, it was pretty clear how you went, for, say, from ensign to captain as an officer in the Navy. But how did you become an admiral? How did you become an advisor to presidents or ambassadors or uh, serve on the staff of an officer? In fact, there weren't even staff 
the whole idea of a naval officer's staff was something developed by the Naval War College uh, in the first part of its history. So this is all ideas that are brand new, very different uh, in this time. And it's a time when the Navy is just changing its uh, uh, from sail to steam. And steam warfare, the idea of steam propulsion, was changing everyone's thinking about it. And it was actually at this point that people began to think back and start reading the classics again because they saw that the maneuverability of uh, on a tactical level, the maneuverability of oared fighting ships uh, seemed to be similar to what, or at least analogous to what was, uh, could be done with a steamship. So a lot of you uh, find some old dry docks, you can find them in Europe somewhere, uh, you can see where they actually had to extend them because they put in long rams uh, like, like uh, ancient warships uh, and they were putting them on warships in the 1870s and 80s at this, at this period. And here's the one of the earliest pictures of the college, a photograph of, of it after it becomes a naval station with a Marine Guard here. Uh, up until we built the new gate out here recently, this was the same road, you came directly up here. Uh, the building itself had been the um, uh, poor house of Newport County, a place for um, People, the homeless people here, the island that we're on now was a farm. Uh, even before that, in the colonial period, it had been a quarantine station. Uh, and you can still see a few of the graves left uh, from that period, of the stones, the actual graves have been, were taken away uh, in the 1930s. Uh, but we still have some of the stones up by the Admiral's house in that direction. Uh, but that house, uh, we remained with the property of the city of Newport. And it was Admiral Luce who came over here in, in 1860. Uh, 61 period when he was an officer at the uh, Naval Academy here in Newport. The Naval Academy had moved up to Newport uh, during the Civil War and uh, he was one of the people who was trying to keep it here and he found the perfect location which was right here. <laughs> uh, that didn't work uh, but he uh, tried again in the 1880s and after a long period he persuaded the city of Newport to give the, this island and this house to the to the state, and the state then very reluctantly gave it to the federal government uh, a long period of time. And it was here on these steps here that uh, Admiral Luce, when he was commander in chief of the Atlantic, came across, he, took it, he was in his flagship, the USS Tennessee, he brought his staff over uh, to the island, beached it on just below the island across what we now call Dewey Field by the officers club there, walked across that grassy area, came up these steps and knocked on the door three times and said, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I christen the poor little poor house, the United States Naval War College. Uh, a couple of days later, uh, the Army Navy Journal, uh, which was sort of equivalent of Navy Times in those days, had headlines that said, Trinity College established in Newport. Um, but uh, that we, we used that line a lot about poor little poor house when we were always asking for money in Washington. They, they did it a lot from the very earliest days. <laughs> Admiral uh, Luce had chosen for his lecture in history. One of the things that he wanted to do, first of all, was that War College was not to be a place of technical study, but a study about the nature of war, about the aspects that were not studied elsewhere. So he wanted history, uh, what the areas that we would call today political science, management, uh, international law, uh, and the areas that were the key ones. He was looking very hard for someone to do, find a, a historian. They were very rare in the Navy and not many people available. Uh, he found a man that actually had helped him, Caspar Goodrich was his first choice, but he was off in, in London, uh, or actually with the Royal Navy, uh, had just been observing for the, for the US Navy the bombardment of Alexandria in Egypt and, uh, in 1883, and he was still over on attache duty. He finally settled on Alfred Thayer Mahan, whose father was a very famous uh, in, uh, instructor at uh, West Point and one of the great interpreters of Jean Manis writing for the American Army. And he wanted someone to do, as he later wrote, to do for the U.S. Navy what Jean Manis had done for the Army in coming up with some, a, a theory. There was no theory of naval warfare at this time. All writing about naval history up to this point had been on a tactical level, not on a strategic level. And so Luce gave Mahan the idea uh, and the assignment, actually, uh, to come here and to study uh, foreign relations, international politics, and find out how relate that to naval activity and uh, develop that. And that became his first lectures here. 
Uh, his first year here as, as assigned to the War College, Mahan was allowed to live at home in New York City, uh, where he could use the New York Public Library and other research activities here. Uh, Luce was president then when Luce just had, was ordered to see back again to command the fleet. Uh, and Mahan was brought in both as the lecturer in history and as president of the War College. Uh, and here is a, in a photo that was taken here at that time. And his initial lectures were on the influence of Separ upon history, 1660 to 1783. He wrote a second volume covering the Napoleonic Wars uh, in that period. Also, in a later period, his, uh, uh, his second presidency was uh, War College lectures here. And this is, what, this is the only image we have of what the inside of, of uh, Loose Hall, or of, I'm sorry, of Founders Hall, the museum, looked like when Mahan was um, lecturing. This is actually, uh, it was, it appeared in the Leslie's Illustrated Weekly in 1889, uh, in January of 1889, and it seems to be, from what we can identify, a lecture by Lieutenant um, Meggs on naval tactics. Uh, uh, at this point, and he's explaining that. But the scene would have been exactly the same in the same lecture room. It was the lecture room of the Naval War College, uh, and it would have been where Mahan gave his lectures here. Uh, in 1892, we were able to build a building of our own. There was a great battle between the technical people in the Navy, the same sort of thing that we always have, a battle between those who want technical education and those who want broad education. Uh, in the t terms that Luce had set out. And the Naval Torpedo School was trying to take over the War College and it actually had a, uh, for a while seemed to be successful about it. And then the tide turned, the politics turned, and we were able to build this building here, the first purpose-built uh, building for the Naval War College, which in 1930 was renamed uh, uh, Luce Hall. And originally, these four, the college occupied the center section here uh, these uh, cupola or domes up here, glass domes, were uh, uh, natural light for the lecture rooms and for the war gaming rooms uh, that were here. But these four uh, corners were quarters for officers. Uh, this quarter down here on this particular end on the southwest corner was the quarters of the president of Naval War College uh, for a couple of years. And the others were occupied by senior faculty members. Three floors, there was a kitchen in the basement, uh, a dining room kitchen, or dining room, uh, sitting room in the first floor, second floor bedrooms, and third floor place for servants. Things were better in those days, I guess. And this is the first image of wargaming. Wargaming came very early at the Naval War College. 1886, the first recorded uh, time we began to think about it. Uh, a young uh, lieutenant who had been disabled uh, because of, uh, he had his eyes damaged up in the Arctic on Naval service. Uh, William McCarty Little was here in town, and he became, came to the War College as a volunteer. And from 1886 until about 1910 uh, or 11, he was not paid. He was a volunteer here working on uh, war gaming, and he developed the whole idea of war gaming. Some of this had been uh, started in the, in the German Army uh, with uh, uh, the war gaming facilities there. And then a man by the name of Fred Jane had developed a, war, a naval war game in England. Uh, but McCarty Little brought it out, developed it further here. And this, you can see, is from 1892. It's a drawing by uh, Rufus Zogbaum, a very famous illustrator. And interestingly, at the same time, uh, the Naval War College, Admiral Henry uh, uh, Taylor, Henry Clay Taylor, was president of the War College. And he had the inno innovation of bringing war gaming into the classroom. At the same time that in those days they were just beginning to develop uh, contingency plans for war planning. And we were beginning to look at the idea of uh, war planning things with possible war with Spain, possible war uh, with Germany over some of their moves in, in South America. You can see it looks like, might look like Cuba there. Uh, so actually some of the games that were going on in this period uh, were actually involved in these very early uh, war gaming facilities and contingency plans. Then in 1894, this is the class on the front steps of uh, Loose Hall, a very a classic view of, uh, uh, for visitors, a uh, photo op place here, but and often a place for where the uh, students would be. You see the class mascot over there, the dog there. Uh, but over here, we have two officers here uh, who are the first foreign officers uh, to attend the Naval War Colleges. Uh, two officers from Sweden, 
who actually went, one of them went back and founded a Swedish Naval War College based on his uh, experience here. In the following year, we had a, a Danish officer come, and then in the year after that, uh, the uh, Imperial German Navy asked to have its officer sent, but the State Department at that time said, no, we won't allow that. Things were getting a little tense, uh, so they wouldn't uh, uh, allow that to happen. But these are the precursors of our current uh, uh, very active international programs that we had here. They, after this period, there were no foreign officers here until uh, the uh, World War II, uh, just after World War II, and when, of course, the current programs get started in the 1950s. And here's a the photo out place. This is uh, under or Assistant Secretary of the Navy, the equivalent of Under Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt in 1897 uh, coming here. This is the second, his second major visit to the War College. He'd come in 1888 to lecture on the War of 1812 at the request of Admiral Luce. And it was through Luce's connection that he met uh, Mahan and developed a great uh, uh, friendship together. Uh, he came here and gave a, a, a famous lecture on naval preparedness and using the, the axiom that, uh, axiom that uh, George Washington had used about preparedness is the best way to uh, prevent war. Uh, he came back again in 1908 and uh, again in uh, 1914 and again in 1918. So he was uh, uh, well known uh, here in Newport. This is a, a president of the War College, Charles Stockton, another very famous uh, officer, officer here. Uh, officer and one who had also been president, but he was the man who we have our current uh, uh, Stockton chair professorship here of international law is named for him. He was one of the great pioneers in international law studies. He wrote the first attempt to codify naval warfare here in 1898 at the Naval War College as, an, as a War College initiative. And it later became in 1901 it was made uh, American law and they and it had to be repealed and redirected because we suddenly decided, well, we have to negotiate this with other countries so we can't be uh, tied in to be, our, to be our law. But he, went, he later went on and uh, represented the United States in 1907 at the uh, London uh, Naval Conference. And uh, after his retirement, he became the president of the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., uh, where there's a, a, a Stockton Hall down there. Here's the, in 1904, we built our first uh, purpose-built library building, uh, Mahan, what we call Mahan Hall, and this is the rotunda room there. And uh, you can see this, this globe that's there, which we acquired uh, about 1910 to 13. We have it on display in the museum, uh, but with the pictures around here. And through here is a little door here, and there was a little private alcove in that section. And uh, we know that uh, Admiral Luce uh, or Admiral Mahan came back here in 1910-11 and used that space uh, when he was finishing his final book on naval strategy. Uh, it was actually a, a, using his old Naval War College lectures and developing it into a, a, a volume on strategy. Um, that was the library until up until uh, uh, 1974 when we moved, built Hewitt Hall. Come on. There we go. The scene uh, about 1910 hasn't changed too much except for the vessels that are out here. You still see the president's house over here. We don't longer have the marine barracks here, but there was the War College and the museum. Uh, museum there, War College here. Uh, and this vessel is the USS Constellation. That's the vessel that's in uh, Baltimore Harbor today. Uh, but she was part of the Naval Training Station here. Um, and some of these other vessels were used for practice and uh, 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 Naval Training Station, uh, recruit training practice here. Here's Secretary of the Navy um, Daniels here in front of the War College, another uh, photo op in 1914. Uh, the man here with the black band on his arm was a, is a student, uh, Captain William S. Sims, later to be president of the War College, later to be our senior commander at the, uh, uh, during World War I, operational commander in Europe. Uh, I'll get to him in a little bit more, but he's wearing that band because his, his mother had just passed away. Uh, but that's the War College faculty. I think this over here, this is McCarty Little in the, in the hat here, a number of others. And when Wargaming moved to Loose Hall, uh, this is an early image about, uh, about the same period, 1912-14 uh, period, 
uh, where they have used little models on ships, not no longer like we do it today on, on uh, uh, computer screens, uh, but they have these square floors, boards here. And that was done up in the attic of, uh, was the presently the attic of Lusol. And one of the early uh, marine uh, students here, um, uh, Pete Ellis, uh, was one of the, he was really the man who invented the idea or developed the idea of the uh, cross country or cross island hopping campaign that would later use in War Plan Orange and then we actually used in World War II. But he was a student here in 1912 13 and actually came up with some of these early ideas at that time, at that very early time. In his, uh, he was part of the two year course that was here. Here's the, what we now call the President's House uh, with a bandstand out in front or across the, the street from it. Uh, the house had originally been built in the 1890s for uh, Commander Naval uh, uh, Training Station here, and, uh, but in, from 1908 it is occupied. Uh, all the presidents of the War College uh, have been using it. And here is a scene in the back of the War College, the uh, recruit training out here on the, on the field here and the battleship fleet in the background coming to visit. The Atlantic fleet would come up here at least once a year in this period and develop here. And the picture is actually taken from one of the fighting top of Constellation. Uh, and this uh, bow sprit that you see over here is from another sail training ship called USS Boxer that was here. But the recruits lining up here as they did here. And this was a very common way to, uh, if, if a dignitary was coming by sea, uh, to greet them here and come up that way. And this is in 1916. This is the German U-boat U-53. This is what I call the when war first came to the War College. This vessel suddenly appeared totally unexpectedly uh, while the United States was neutral in First World War. It appeared at the entrance to Narragansett Bay here, uh, surfaced, flashing my light message, uh, request permission to enter port. She came in, anchored just here off the War College, uh, and uh, sent a boat ashore. Her commanding officer made a courtesy call on the president of Naval War College, who was also the commandant of the Naval District, uh, then uh, uh, Rear Admiral Austin M. Knight, uh, the famous author of Knight's Modern Seamanship that we still uh, use today in the Navy. Uh, but he came in, a lot of activity, a lot of press about this visit here, uh, shortly after the Zimmerman telegram issue. The First World War, so people were buzzing what was going on. They very ostentatiously uh, left some messages uh, ashore that were apparently taken to the embassy in Washington. Uh, and then uh, she left uh, port, uh, went out off of international waters, off of uh, 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 outside of um, uh, Cape Cod, and sank five vessels out there. Not American vessels, but belligerents in the war, in, in the war against Germany. Uh, so it was the first time that actually War College, the war came to the War College. Whoops, a bit too much. This is Admiral Sims. Um, he had became, uh, he had succeeded Knight as president of the War College as a captain in 1917. He was sent secretly uh, uh, as president of the War College to London to talk to the British about what the United States would do, how the navies could operate together if, they, if we did get into war. While there, he stayed on uh, through uh, 1919 and went from uh, captain to four-star full admiral uh, in that position, uh, then dropped back uh, to two-star to become president of the Naval War College again in uh, 1919. Uh, he was our commander-in-chief U.S. Naval Forces Europe, the senior operational commander uh, in Europe during World War I. Uh, so it played a very important role uh, he also brought with him ideas. He had been a War College, uh, two-year student here at the War College, uh, and brought with him ideas about staffs, developed an, the oper an oper a really effective operational staff uh, in Europe uh, at this time. So it made a, a very great uh, impact. And here he is in his last year as uh, president of the War College, just before he retired in 1923. You can see him sitting here with a beard up here. And very interestingly, all the way back up here, the junior guy in the back row uh, is Commander Chester W. Nimitz. So you have in this one picture at the War College uh, the two really great leaders of the two world wars right here in Newport uh, connected at the War College. But there's some other people here in this, in this interesting photo. Over here, this man here is a captain. Uh, he's uh, Admiral, would later be Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Admiral Stark. 
Uh, he would be the CNO uh, during, at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack. And in the front, you have uh, Admiral Lanning, later president of the War College and Battle Fleet Commander. Uh, and then you have uh, here um, a couple of other fleet commanders are also. So a very distinguished uh, class, the class of 1923, the last class that Sims uh, presided over. And here in, in 1924, we had a distinguished uh, visitor, a uh, foreign visitor. This is uh, uh, Japanese Admiral uh, Ite, Ide. Uh, who came here, and he brought with him his aide, this guy. Uh, oh, sorry, this, the, one with the, the one with the top hat over here, uh, the young guy in the background. And his name was Yamamoto, uh, the man who developed the, uh, uh, planned the attack on Pearl Harbor. He had been earlier at the, uh, studied at Harvard in, during the World War I period uh, when Admiral Sims was away, and the War College was actually closed in that period. And I'm always having a little battle with the people on Wikipedia who keep trying to say that, that Yamamoto was a graduate of the New U.S. Naval War College and keep putting him in our foreign uh, dignitaries here. He wasn't, <laughs> but he did visit. <laughs> and uh, uh, he was a graduate of the Japanese Naval War College. But that's one of those little trivia facts that we're constantly working with. And here uh, up here, this is um, at this point, Rear Admiral uh, Pratt, President of the Naval War College, with the Secretary of the Navy, Curtis Wilbur, entering the college uh, in the mid-1920s. Admiral Pratt uh, goes on and becomes, uh, is the, so far the only President of the War College to become uh, Chief of Naval Operations. Uh, and he had the tough job of being the uh, CNO uh, in the Hoover administration, uh, when Hoover was trying to keep the Naval Forces down and uh, uh, with his Quaker background. Uh, but then he also w was in the first part of the uh, period uh, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt was president in 1932 is when he went out of office at 33. This is a war gaming. This is Pringle Hall, the Naval Staff College uh, Lounge, uh, if you know it over there. Uh, this was the, the first purpose-built war gaming facility anywhere in the U.S. Navy. And this floor here, uh, and at least until fairly recently, or may still be, bits of it may still be under the carpet there, uh, showing these uh, blocks. I, I, I have seen it in my time here, but I think it may have been destroyed, I'm not sure. Uh, but there they played the games here, put the, the model ships out here, uh, had the uh, observers could be on the uh, area up here. And then there are these wires that go across which could keep the competing teams, uh, teams so they couldn't see what the other side, the movements they were taking. But all the war plans that were done in preparation for World War II, the, uh, where they're trying out War Plan Orange and other plans that were done here, uh, both strategic and tactical level games, were all done here on this game floor until the 19, uh, late 1940s when we required Sims Hall and began to move our facility, war gaming facility uh, down there. And of course, then later, in 1990s, it's come up to uh, McCarty Little Hall. But life at the War College is always the same. A uh, young officer comes here and says, well, it's nice, I can relax. Place to a nice year to relax at Newport. Uh, nothing to do. Uh, I've had a hard time out at sea. And come back, and, uh, and then, then there's that old War College faculty saying, well, you got to read this, and you got to read that, and keep going. Uh, so time marches on, and here's Commander B.S. in May 38. Uh, pulling his hair out, uh, preparing his papers for some prof somewhere in the War College. Admiral Kalpfus, who was price, twice president of the War College, uh, if you come to work down the direct shot down the, from the main street up there, you're on Admiral Kalpfus Boulevard uh, or Admiral Kalpfus Road. He was, uh, had such a great relationship with the city of Newport uh, that they named the, named the road after him. Uh, after his second period of uh, his presidency here. But he was one of those who would uh, come here. He, was, he was a, had been a battle fleet commander, uh, and he would come out as a battle, commander of battleships, battle fleet, which was one of the very highest positions in the U.S. Navy in the, in the 20s and 30s as a three-star. Uh, he came out and dropped down to two-star to become president of the Naval War College, uh, went out again and became a four-star as commander of battle fleet, and then dropped down again to be a two-star to be president of the War College again uh, in the late 1930s. And finally, uh, at the very end of his term, in the first part of World War I, uh, uh, they changed the law 
and you know, the uh, stars no longer went with the exact job, it went with the person. So the equals again, he was the first person to raise his flag as a four star uh, here at the Naval War College. He later went on to become the first uh, director of naval history uh, in Washington. He was one of the people who in, one of the, investigated the uh, war, uh, Pearl Harbor uh, attack. A uh, very distinguished guy. Here during World War I, a huge buildup here of naval activities locally. Uh, and this, uh, we have this chart in the, war uh, in the museum. You can see it a little bit, but it shows the wide range of activities over here. Uh, over this island here, we, for example, we had an ammunition depot. Uh, over here, Quonset Point, uh, Naval Air Station, uh, the, the uh, CB Battalion on Davisville. Uh, here uh, on the far ends out here, uh, and actually on, on this side, there were 16-inch uh, uh, guns that were land, uh, coastal defense guns uh, that were put in place here. And you can still see some of the bunkers for those things. All this whole area here was anti-aircraft batteries developed out here uh, and different activities here. So it was an extremely uh, busy place. Admiral Kalfas uh, was uh, given additional duty as commander operating base uh, in Newport. Uh, so he was the overall commander over all of this, as well as being uh, president of the Naval War College. And, uh, and this is actually the time when we first begin to get our, uh, the first admiral's barge here, because the admiral needed a barge to go around to all these different activities in the, in the bay. And so we began to have a, a, a barge uh, in the area. Here, uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, is visiting the War College. Here he is in front of the War College Museum. Here you can see him back here. Uh, and then you see Senator, uh, Senator Green of Rhode Island here. Our airport is named for him. Uh, and uh, Captain Welch, the base commander, Al Admiral Kalfas here in an open. He'd come, uh, of course, he was uh, crippled and with a polio, so he wasn't able to walk around. But they had him in a car here, and he came and, and uh, uh, reviewed the troops uh, in the recruit training uh, station here. and was down by the officers club and up here uh, around the, the uh, War College. And I don't believe he entered the building, but he was given a briefing here about the War College and met everyone. This is uh, one of our important alumni gatherings in the Pacific on board the USS uh, Indianapolis. Uh, here you have uh, Chester Nimitz here, uh, graduate of the class of 1923. Ernest J. King, uh, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, commander of um, a graduate here in uh, uh, 1932. And uh, Raymond Spruance, uh, a commander a graduate in uh, 1927. Of course, it's Spruance who comes back. Uh, he has four tours of duty here uh, after in winning the Battle of Midway. I'll give you another picture of him. Here he is as president of the Naval War College as a four star uh, from 1946 to 48. He probably could have had any job he wanted in the Navy, but he was very happy to come back to Newport. Uh, because he felt, as Sims did after the First World War, uh, that here was where he could uh, develop uh, new ideas and look ahead to the future uh, more effectively than anywhere else. It would have a lasting effect. Uh, and he also particularly liked the, the Admiral's house and because it, it, it had its uh, view of the water. And they thought, they asked him, well, you know, maybe you'd like to go to Annapolis. And he said, no, no, too close to Washington and there's no view. Uh, so he liked it here. Uh, but some of the things that he did in his presidency here uh, remained with us. Uh, Sims Hall he was able to acquire here, which we named for Admiral Sims. It was a war gaming facility and also was head of our location where our logistics uh, department was located in those days. Uh, the information service for officers was something that was started in uh, uh, his period here. Now the Naval War College Review, a way of getting information and lectures and ideas that happened here at the War College and circulating them wider uh, than just a Newport audience uh, throughout the Navy. And this is what uh, is the beginning of our Naval War College review. Originally, uh, you can see it's actually crossed out at the bottom, it's originally restricted uh, data. Uh, I got into trouble as a young officer in the, in the 19, uh, early 1970s because as a lieutenant I'd uh, written, written an article for it. And uh, my executive officer was extremely, I was outraged because uh, readership in those days was limited to lieutenant commanders and above. And so how could a lieutenant write for it? But, uh, that was the kind of struggles that we had in, in those days. Uh, Admiral Bates uh, was here, brought here by Spruance uh, to be the, to analyze the battles of the, world, of the Second World War. Uh, he had the, the, what was called the World War II Battle Evaluation 
uh, group. And he was here for many, many years, and from 19, uh, well, 1946 until uh, up into the early 1970s when he died. Uh, but he did wonderful work there, which was used by Samuel Elliott Morrison in his operational history of World War II. Uh, and he also later became the first director, executive director of the Naval War College Foundation. Uh, and I'll start with that. Very crusty guy, I remember him well. Another uh, of the older generation that was here, Henry Eccles, who uh, our library is named for, uh, Naval Academy graduate 1922, classmate of uh, Admiral Rickover, and a great rival to him. They were, had great uh, discussions uh, back and forth. But he was the kind of, he was a, a self-educated philo naval philosopher uh, who uh, really developed ideas about naval strategy, wrote some important books uh, about naval strategy, now quite outdated, but he was really a pioneer uh, in his period as, as well in the field of, of naval logistics. And, and he, uh, and I should have pointed out this tie he's wearing is the first Naval War College tie, which was invented by Admiral Bates. <laughs> a bit of trivia there. And then we have the connection here, long connection with Felix de Weldon, the sculptor. Uh, here he is, uh, de Weldon here standing, and that is Admiral Conley. Conley Hall is named for him, president of the War College, uh, been a uh, commander in chief of uh, uh, Europe. The first uh, international courses took place uh, during his presidency. But uh, de Weldon had come here in 19. Uh, right after the war, actually, 1946-47, established his studio here, uh, got acquainted with um, uh, Admiral Spruance. Uh, Spruance put him on the idea that he should um, perhaps make a statue of the flag raising at Iwo Jima. We have one of his first models out there in the, in the lobby uh, that he made, the plaster copy of it. He did all the models of the, uh, all the um, uh, plaster that is, uh, reliefs that are in the Dewellian passageway here. He did busts of every president of the War College from Admiral Spruitz up to Admiral Kurth in, in 1990. So a very close friend of the college and we have a, one of the largest collections of his art anywhere uh, here in the War College. Uh, this is what uh, wargaming looked like when I first came here in the, in the uh, uh, late 1960s. This huge screen, the way the moves were played there and the teams in the background and different activities going on. And uh, we had a fleet base here. This is the heavy cruiser uh, uh, Newport News passing the War College here. You can see the old signal tower here uh, controlling movements, naval movements in the harbor. Here, the old communication station and the old um, antennas uh, here at the college in the 1950s. In 1957, uh, Newport becomes the place for the summer White House uh, for President Eisenhower. Uh, he, when Newport was served three times in his second term as the Summer White House. And one summer he had a heart attack, so he didn't come, go anywhere uh, beyond Gettysburg. Uh, but he came here and he lived in the house right next to uh, the Admiral's house, what we now call Quarters A. Uh, and he spent the month of um, September 1957 there. He signed the Civil Rights Act there. The um, uh, Little Rock integration crisis occurred in that period. Governor Orville Falbus came up here in a uh, helicopter and landed on the uh, uh, sidewalk there between the officers club and the top of the hill uh, and came up to get directions from the president on that occasion uh, when the federal troops were going in. And uh, uh, then he, he had also had a visitor from the uh, King of uh, Belgium was here, who we believe he entertained in the Admiral's Barge. The Admiral's Barge was brand new in those days. Here he is greeting uh, some of the first officers in our uh, Naval Command College uh, when they were here that summer. And here he is in an unusual picture we've just uh, located. This is the presidential yacht, Barbara Ann, leaving Coasters Harbor Island. And these are sailors from this naval station here saluting as the president leaves uh, at the end of 1957. Uh, much of the time, it, uh, Eisenhower's interest here, of course, was not in the Navy. It was a, a general of the Army. Uh, and he really was here in Newport to play golf uh, so for his, his holiday. Uh, so, but he had the presidential yacht here, based down here in the marina, and he would take that over in order to, not to tie up traffic going in town. Uh, he would take the uh, boat across the bay uh, and then use, it, use this uh, as presidential yacht as a kind of floating locker room to change and be ready when he got back up here. Um, so it was a useful occasion. Later in his t other two summers, he was at Fort Adams in what's now called Eisenhower House. Uh, but his office remained, the White House office remained here on base and was located in a little uh, uh, 
uh, extension to the museum, which no longer stands, but that's what his office looked like with a presidential flag. We have that presidential flag in the museum uh, today. He gave it to us in uh, 1960 when he left, left here. But when he had official business to do, he would come over here and deal with it. And here is uh, President Kennedy uh, here outside of uh, Pringle Hall. He spoke in Pringle Hall at that point. And he was just uh, a more, uh, John, Do uh, John uh, um, this is Foster Dulles, uh, CIA director, and John McCone, who was just becoming uh, the new director of CIA. He made that announcement uh, here at the Naval War College. Kennedy, of course, uh, his um, mother-in-law, the Auchincloss family summer home here, which he occasionally used as, as the summer White House although more often he was up in, on Cape Cod at his own home. And here in 1972, uh, you have the uh, Stansfield-Turner and the so-called Turner Revolution here, uh, Secretary of the Navy uh, Middendorf up here, um, the first chairman of our strategy and policy department. This is the address, uh, Turner gives an address at this occasion uh, in which he announces the new curriculum, the new organization which we, we still have uh, here today. Uh, as uh, Secretary Middendorf was talking, uh, there was a, a loose uh, helicopter somehow got out of uh, Quonset Point, and there's a young lieutenant, me, up here in the office as the Admiral speechwriter trying to get this helicopter out of the way so the audience could hear, <laughs> hear what the Secretary of the Navy was saying. Uh, we finally got control and got the guy out of there. And here, uh, Turner brought some of his Naval Academy classmates here. Uh, those of us who were junior officers around here at the time said, you know, who is this guy? Uh, the governor of Georgia, yeah, okay, Naval Academy graduate, you know, what, what's going on? Well, Admiral being smarter than lieutenants, uh, the uh, guy, uh, Carter announced his, pres his run for president of the United States a week later. And Turner becomes uh, later, uh, under his, in his presidency, the director of, Na of uh, National Intelligence, uh, CIA director. And also in uh, Turner's period, uh, the Naval Staff College is, is established. Here its origins are really earlier into the presidency of, of Admiral Colbert, uh, who had been, as a captain, had been the uh, uh, first uh, NCC director. Uh, but this is the first director of NC, Naval Staff College, uh, Jack Quinn, and the deputy uh, at the time uh, here, and the first uh, uh, Naval Staff College class in 1972. And then, of course, we get our, our new buildings being developed here. Uh, here, this, this is a model, which you can see in the museum, the builder's model of it. Uh, the Spruance Hall, where we are now, Conley Hall here, uh, Hewitt Hall, and then a couple of things that were never built. Uh, although McCarty Little Hall looked like that, that was originally supposed to be the library. Uh, interesting, they retained a, a similar sort of design uh, for it. And then there was this huge bell tower uh, that was to be here on International Plaza. Uh, and also in the center of Colbert Plaza were to be huge statues of naval heroes. Uh, and we have one or two small maquettes of this. We have a maquette of Admiral Byrd, Richard Byrd, uh, the explorer that was to be there. But those are some of the uh, things that perhaps were fortunately not built. Uh, but they were in the, in the <laughs> and they couldn't get the funding for those. And then here on this very stage, here, Admiral Stockdale, President of the War College, Medal of Honor winner uh, as a prisoner of war in Vietnam, leading the uh, uh, prisoners of war in that occasion. Uh, but he brought Henry Kissinger here. I was present for this. It's the only occasion that I know of in the history of the War College when everyone in the audience was required uh, to be in black tie or mess dress. Uh, so some of us uh, had to go out and junior faculty members had to go out and buy a uh, black tie for the event, which we did. Uh, and Admiral Stockdale was here, and uh, his wife spoke, and they were, it was really a very interesting occasion when uh, Mrs. Stockdale, of course, had led, really led the fight uh, for prisoners of war uh, and to bring that to national attention. And uh, Secretary Kissinger acknowledged her great uh, success in, in doing that. And here in uh, 1981, the Strategic Studies Group was uh, established here, uh, now headed by Admiral Hogg uh, here. But here's uh, Admiral Tom Hayward, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, President of the War College, uh, uh, Admiral Welch, and uh, former Undersecretary of the Navy, Murray, here, who was the first dean of the Center for Naval Warfare Studies, which was established at the same, same time. Uh, but we had some, some of the first people here. Uh, uh, here you have uh, Admiral Sobrowski, was a commander here, later president of the War College, 
and a couple of other uh, uh, admiral, a um, uh, couple of other major figures who fleet commanders in there. And then uh, in 1984, the college has celebrated its 100th anniversary. And this is the centenary uh, convocation for that event on Colbert Plaza. We used to have all our uh, events out there, and now they're too big. We have them in a tent outside uh, on, uh, on Dewey Field. Uh, but uh, Secretary of the Navy John Lehman was here for that occasion. We presented him with the history of the college at that uh, moment. And we uh, celebrated our 100th anniversary on the 6th of October, uh, 1984. And then in, in 1990, of course, in 91, the McCarty Little Building is built as our newest purposely built building. We've since expanded to other buildings uh, belonging to other commands down the street. Uh, more recent presidents of a college, a great tradition that we have here of uh, portraits of presidents. Uh, <laughs> this is our most, most recent one, but we have a a collect, as you'll see up in the Admiral's Passageway uh, up there, a, a wonderful collection, a very rare collection of naval officers' portraits. Uh, they can't rarely be seen anywhere else in the Navy. Uh, and we're very proud to have this here, and we hope that tradition continues. And here you can see the uh, aerial view of the War College, Admiral's House here, museum here, the original buildings here, Loose Hall, Pringle, uh, Maham. Spruance and all work down, down this way, the campus of what it looks like today. And there, in the, in, in the 120th anniversary, we put out a coin. We also put one out for the 125th anniversary coin to celebrate our uh, 125 years now, 127 years, uh, going to 128 this year. So that, in fact, ends my presentation, but I'd be glad to have any questions, take any questions that you have. Uh, on the history of the college, or stop in anytime at the across the street at the War College Museum. Thank you very much. <laughs>